So what do you guys think of that? I just show of hands real quick. How many of you have seen Martin Dodge before? A good number of you. Earlier today, how many of you just saw him for of the people with their hands up right now? How many of you just saw him for the first time earlier today? So still, some of you have gone out and seen Martin perform before, or have some of his records, or yeah, All right. newbies. What'd you think? Yeah. How many of you gear gear people are just like waiting for the moment when you can stand up at the end of this thing and run up here and, and see how the gymnasium works? <laughs> I'm kind of curious myself. The head rush, Talk the DD3. Here. What about the head rush? Your your uh, your 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 system has evolved since the last time I've seen. It's been a while. You know, I realized that uh, this is in retrospect. Do, do you guys all know the Herbie Hancock record called Thrust? 1970, the one that came after Headhunters. Is, is it the spaceship when he's in the spaceship? Yeah, the, okay, so the, the cover of that record is Herbie Hancock flying a spaceship, but there's all, all the controls but it's are a, keyboards. It's a keyboard spaceship. He's flying over Machu Picchu, right? Yeah. And like, I didn't even think about this until like some, it, like it'd be like a year, nine months ago, a year ago. I looked at my stuff and I'm like, wait a minute, that's the Herbie Hancock album cover. We just need to get a little plastic bubble to go over the top and, and that'd be awesome. There you'd be. That would actually help with the drum feedback too, so maybe that's an actual possibility. Yeah. The man in a bubble. So I'm David Campbell. You guys know Harry, right? Yeah. Martin Dosh here. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, who you are. And I've got some great questions from the audience members, so we'll, I'll filter some of those in. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Martin before, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd start sort of at the beginning. And with the interest in increasing the real estate in the realm of parts of speech, I mean, you, Martin Dosh, are a noun, and Dosh, the project, is a noun. I thought we'd work it into a verb. You know, how you came up with the idea of, of doing what you do, which is a pretty unique thing that I don't think I've ever seen anybody else do. So that, that's what we're going to call doshing from here on out tonight. Yeah. When, did, when did you first come up with the idea to dosh? Uh, well, I definitely didn't, I mean, I've, <clears throat> when I first, basically the idea is like looping drums. Like I haven't really, I never heard anybody do that before. Because the friend who lent me the first Takai Headrush pedal play guitar and I was like, here's how you make your loop on a guitar and then you, you play a riff and then you can solo over the top of it. And I, it took me like maybe six months to be like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I plug my drums into that thing. Or a vacuum cleaner or, or vacuum anything cleaner else. Or whatever, yeah. I mean, it turns out. Obviously, I'm not the first person to do this. I mean, like, John Bryan's been doing it since, like, 1990-whatever, 1999. But it is, I did come, come upon it on my own. I didn't really, like, you know, there was no internet. I had no idea what was happening. So it was, it was an intuitive thing. So 1999, probably, I would say. And were, were the drums sort of the first, uh, the first experiment? Or were you, did you immediately, because you're, you're not just a... You're a drummer, you're a percussionist in the in the true sense of the word, in that you first started out with keys, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, and I think the first time I ever really used a sampler and actually figured out, this is way before I did the drum stuff, is just going back to all my four-track tapes, hooking the four-track four track up to the Akai head rush, and trying to find the perfect you know one-bar break, then looping that in the head rush. So I'm, I'm recording like a recording of myself playing drums. Mm -hmm. Then I'd record that and then I'd layer keys on top of it. So that's sort of like, doing that for six months sort of prepared me for like the, oh wait, I could actually just play live drums into it. It'd be the same thing. Did you, did you ever, when as, as you were experimenting with this stuff, did, were you, was it in preparation for like a gig or was it just purely, um, you know, like something you had to do was out of mu musical curiosity? Uh, well, it, Absolutely, first of all, it was musical curiosity. But then I had already put out my first record, and I was like, wait a minute, I could try to play a show with this stuff. And so then, it would, then was the first task was like, how am I going to play these songs in a <laughs> format that's you know, set up in 12-second loops? It turned out that most of the tunes in the first record actually fit. Yeah. So it worked. It's sort of the great tradition of, uh, of um, sort of musical motivation. I think a lot of times people are like, Here's where I want to be. I can kind of get myself there through this route, and now I got to figure out somehow to get from here to there in that way, or it's just not not going to work out. It was a major challenge, and it was, it was sort of like everything sort of happened at the same time. It was the same like year, year and a half of time period. Yeah. 
Yeah, Martin, I'm really interested. Your technique is a very interesting one where you have these loops mm -hmm. and they repeat and you build layers and repetition in music. It can be a two-edged sword. I mean, it's right. our friend and it's, you know, can take you in places where everybody is solid, but repetition can become monotonous. Absolutely. I mean, your, your pieces rise way above that. But, I mean, what's your strategy about using so much repetition but avoiding monotony? Well, the strategy is basically to try not to bore myself. So, and generally my standards for myself are a little bit high. Like, I've just found over the years of playing that like, my own criticism of myself is always far worse than anything most other people would think, you know? So, if I'm playing a song and I'm like, wow, that riff's been going for like three minutes, or like, it seems that it's been going for too long. Once I get that thought, that generally tells me that I probably should move on to something else, you know? Yeah, yeah. There was a, a one person asked, uh, what was your first gig? And, and I don't know if the person meant that, um, what was your first gig ever, or what was your first Dodge gig? So I thought maybe you could share both. Oh man, my first gig ever was awesome. And I have a, I have a uh, somewhere in my parents' basement on a VHS cassette somewhere. This is a uh, you know your classic high school talent show. Okay, right? I'm gonna go with hair band. No, 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 this is not a hair band. I, mean, I guess I did have long hair, but it was straight like it is now, you know. Yeah. But no, so my my big idol in high school is John Bonham, right? So okay. I, you know, I had this told my parents got me this sweet set for Christmas, this beautiful Slingerland set, but it was only four piece. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I need to get like an eight piece set. And a gong. So I traded this <laughs> set that now is worth like two grand and for some just piece of crap, eight piece set and did the, play the talent show. But you looked sweet. I did look sweet. I had, I had the blue John Bonham bandana. All that song remains <laughs> the same. I did like a four minute drum solo. I haven't actually, I tried to find that tape, I haven't seen it in like years, like probably 15 years, but... Did you, know. you win the talent show? No, I didn't win the talent show. <laughs> I think it's a little gift win. It's a little remember? Christmas gift to all the fans, you gotta put that up on the tube. No, that, that needs to be, that's what I mean, it has to be on YouTube, and this is like... <laughs> Me at 15 years old, like, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, playing like a I went to a, si drum set. a similar thing um, that Dave King did in the basement of the... Um, uh, what was it? The Dinky Towner. Mm -hmm. This was like 10 years ago. And I'm not joking, Dave King, one of the, the greatest drummers I've ever seen, showed video of himself and his hair band in high school, during which the lead guitar player's spandex pants ripped <laughs> wide open. <laughs> it was like a public access cable performance. Yes. That's what YouTube is for. You know, um, a lot of people, uh, I think, are curious about, um, you know, where 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 you come from, musically, um, both like the influences that help shape your sound or approach to making music, and just in a more simple, you know, sense, what you like to go out and see musically and, and what you like to listen to. Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite, still my favorite thing. You know, I'm almost 40 years old now. I've been doing this for a long time, and. Uh, to this day, my favorite, one of the main reasons I play music is because my favorite thing, one of my favorite things, is to go see a band I've never seen before or heard of before and just have my mind blown away. You know, like, when you, you've kind of heard about a band, maybe they're good, maybe they're not, you heard part of a tune, like, oh, go check them out. You haven't heard the record, you go see them, and you're just like, that is the greatest thing I've seen. And, you know, it just, it's just like consciousness expanding, so. Do you remember the I last think, time that that happened to you? Uh, the last time that happened with the band was probably the James Blake show in the entry. I had heard a few of his tunes before, but seeing him play with his band was incredible. Before, the, before that was probably like five years before that when I saw uh, Deer Hunter play the Triple Rock. And I had only heard maybe a, snippets of their tunes and their, yeah, their live sounds, their presence, and you know, some of the tunes are just mind-blowing. Really good. What do you like to, uh, what did you like to listen to as, in sort of your formative years, maybe when you were at the age of... Uh, a lot of the kids out here. Yeah, that, so I mean, that was sort of like everything. I mean, I think when I was in college, um, I had a friend who was, uh, he wasn't an exchange student, but he was from, from Scotland, and uh, he had a pretty massive record collection. And he, it was everything. So we'd listen to just like everything from like the cheesiest R&B, you know, like Edwin Bird song or something like that. And then we'd, you know, pop on Black Sabbath and or and then follow that with the Grateful Dead, follow that with, you know, 
the, the Blood Honey's record that came out with it, Touch Me I'm Sick. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like Jane's Addiction. It was like every conceivable style of music sort of all at the same time. And the stuff that really stuck with me at, at that time, I think, was mostly like the jazz stuff. You know, and I liked all of it, mm -hmm. but, you know, early teens was like classic rock. And then I was kind of into like Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, that kind of stuff. But I mean, I liked all of it. It wasn't like I wasn't like, I don't like Jane's Addiction, but, you know, I heard it all. And so I don't really, it's kind of hard to say what really stuck from that, those times, you know. It sounds like a, a lot of it did, especially like looking back at, I mean, you, you um, there's not really one genre or uh, specific sound that you borrow your like equipment from. Right. I mean, it's sort of from all over the map a little bit. I mean, what do you think? I, I, was, I was trying to jot down a question. I don't think I ever came up with a proper question for this, but... Where do you feel like you most are aligned? I mean, do you feel like it seems like a lot of this? The it's a tough question, and that's one of the things that's sort of been a struggle for me over the years playing music. Is that it is it is not easily defined. I mean, my record label that, that puts out my stuff is sort of indie hip hop, and they've always been that's been the Anticon thing. Um, but you're certainly whether, not like like no. hip hop fans might. You know, maybe might the, like the beat it. builders would be into it, but right. the MCs probably don't know what to make of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing is I've asked, get, get requ gotten requests over the years for like, yo, send me a beat, man, from like everybody, and I'm like, okay, here's a beat, and then nothing ever happens. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, Come on, Sage Francis, <laughs> or whoever, you know, like, <laughs> like, I can't rap over that, what, it's in four, <laughs> come on, dude. And so, I don't know, I mean, I've, I've heard so much rap stuff that is really weird, so it's maybe just, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe I missed the boat, maybe it was too early, maybe it was too late. Dosh, the hip-hop producer, <laughs> just, just hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, you know, you've, you've uh, I don't know, how many of you guys have seen Andrew Bird? Any Andrew Bird fans out there? Okay. So, what, about four or five years ago? Yep. You said the 2000s, well, the first tour is like 2000, or the late 2005, so yeah, five years. About five years ago, Marty started um, accompanying Andrew Bird. Or maybe you'd open for him and then start doing some songs together. It was kind of both. Yeah, the first tour was like opening for and playing with. And uh, to the uh, the uh, you know, it meant, I think just about everyone was was happy when this happened. But you guys sort of joined forces, and Andrew, in a very different way, incorporates a lot of similar principles or had at that time as he was touring by himself. Um, and I was curious when what happened. When the you know with the fusion of the two looping styles, were there any integration issues with your approaches, or was it Im immediately sort of a uh, you know a sympathetic effort? No, it was very sympathetic. I mean, I think the the biggest trick was sort of back in you know 2005 and six when we were just a two piece band was actually arranging how we're going to make it sound like a full band. You know, yeah. and then Jeremy Olasaka joined the following year, and it made it a lot more easy because he's playing the low end stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in some ways, it was more fun just doing it the two of us because it was so. Uh, it, it was way more work for me. I mean, it, it was like, I, okay, here's lay down the drum part. Okay, now I'm going to play the bass line over here while playing this. So I was doing a lot of like playing the bass line with this hand while playing the full on rock drum stuff, and so I, I don't miss that at all. But. The, the challenge of it was pretty cool, but as far as like the sympathetic thing and as far as us locking in together, it was like a piece of cake. It was like easy. Martin, you mentioned you're almost 40. Mm -hmm. You're obviously still making great music. You're touring. you got another tour coming up soon. Yep. Talk to this group who, you know, they're here hoping to learn to, uh, you know, be able to make a life doing what they love doing, and which is what I assume you have been able to do. Yes. So maybe... Do you have any thoughts? Talk a little about your career. You mentioned a record label. Are you still with them? Are you doing your own thing now? How are you able to make a life doing what you love doing? Well, that's, I mean, I am, but it's, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm just turned 39, so it's been, I've been doing it for a long time. And I would say that I didn't even really totally, you know, I didn't stumble upon this whole looping thing or being able to play drums and roads simultaneously. Or even writing my own songs, or like learning how to sample stuff and record stuff, till I was probably about 24 years old. And so, you know, if you look at it that way, like I didn't even sort of realize what I was, you know, I didn't sort of find my voice. So you didn't know say. how to dash until yeah. you were in your 20s. <laughs> I know that. I mean, no, I put out that that first record came out in, when I was 29. So, and that was the beginning of all this. Everything has flowed from that. But 
you know, if I hadn't persevered to that point, none of this would have happened. If I had been like, well, I should really just get a job or whatever, or, you know. My mom and dad are really disappointed in me. Or, <laughs> and not, not that they weren't disappointed, but they're always like, you know, well, have you thought about any other options besides this music thing, you know? Um, but no, I worked... What, what was the backup plan, just out of curiosity? Well, I, I worked in a Montessori school over in South Minneapolis up until 2004. So I was teaching percussion to, uh, like, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, I did that from, like, 90, 99 to probably 2005 until the bird stuff started happening. And then I substituted in various parts in the, in the school. But that was actually a huge influence, too, is working with, working with uh, you know, 8 through 12-year-olds. That was, like, insanely amazing experience because... Do you guys know what orf instruments are? Those, those things that are tuned in C. So in the Montessori music room, they have all these like you know, marimba style ones, and then glockenspiel and uh, vibraphones too. But they're all tuned in C. So it's basically like me and a bunch of you know fifth and sixth grade boys, and occasionally girls, um, just having a band together and like you know we're writing songs together except I just happen to be twice as old as they are. Um, but that was a hugely you know, informative to pride of my style and the simplicity of, you know, the key of C or B flat or whatever. What, uh, it, uh, one of the, the folks out here asked for uh, advice for the upstart. What direction can you give a musician who's just starting out their career? Um, you just love what you do. You know, if you, if you don't, if you don't love what you do, you should be doing something else, really. I mean, it's, uh, like I said earlier in the workshop, like with the first time I sat down at the drums, the very first time when I was 15 years old, I just sort of knew like this is what I should be doing, and uh, I just somehow stuck with it. You know, I don't know. I'm glad you shared this story about teaching, though. You know, because I think when people get the idea that they're going to go into music, that there's sort of a direct feeder program, like you're going to become a teacher. You know, I mean not. I mean, it's the same profession, but in a very different way. I mean, you know, you go to high school, you go to college, you get a teaching degree, then you get a job teaching. And finding your way in the musical world can be a much more, uh, there's a lot more detours on the path. Indeed. At which points, uh, a lot of times you have to find a straight, sort of a straight job that is in some way kind of, um, that you can stomach, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And uh, I think that that's a, that's a really important... A, a wise man once told me when I was first starting out in the radio world, which is the exact same way. I mean, you just, you just wait. You find where you want to be and you wait and hone your craft and wait. He's like, you got to have a little hustle on the side. And uh, it's the one piece of advice that, that, I, I would, uh, that I would say is it most profoundly affected my direction and I think is applicable to just about everybody the music yeah, industry. I mean, the, the, sort of the model now is to do as many things as you possibly can at the same time. You know, to play in like five or six bands and just wait for one of them to break or whatever. But, and that that is a good way to go. But I mean, I'm you know, you're definitely going to wind up pissing somebody off. So <laughs> it's like you, to try to maintain playing six bands um, is a, is a gratuitous challenge. And like, in order for people to like <laughs> understand that that. They must really want you in the band because you have to be a you know, pretty badass to be able to like pull that off. You can't do Martin, that. anybody that's trying to make a living in music, you know, obviously pays attention to what's happening in the music industry, and it's been changing quite a lot. Uh, and how how has that affected you? What are you doing now with record labels kind of in decline and the changes? How have you met that challenge? Well, luckily, I've been putting us putting stuff out for a while, so I sort of have like all my stuff registered with BMI, and those. It seems like a minor thing, you know. You're like, well, where is this going to get played? But you know, when, when you have if you write a song and someone plays it, um, or someone covers it, whatever. People Who's covering Dash songs, songs, by the way? Oh, I don't know, but, but like, if, like if you if you really has the stones for that. <laughs> but if you like, say you registered on BMI. And you go play, and you you like do it. You get flown over to Paris to do a show. They make you fill out a little form that tells the name of the song, how long it is, blah blah. And then like a year later, you get a check for twenty five bucks for each one of those songs that you played. So it's one of those things where you, it's you kind of might not think it might help. 
but it might, but it just sort of over time, it accumulates so to the point now where it's like every, every four, you know, four times a year, I get my little BMI check and it's like, wow, you know, like, the, how is that even, it's like free money, you know? The work's already done. It was done a long time ago. Do you see in the demise of the music industry as we knew it, opportunity for people? Absolutely. I think that the one thing that sort of needs to, the biggest thing that needs to change is this sort of the general mentality that music should be free. You know, that's that's like the way it just seems like, I don't know, maybe a lot of you guys feel that way, like music should, be, you shouldn't have to pay for music unless you want to. And I guess that is okay, but it's kind of easy to cop out on that and say, well, I'll just, I'll rip this CD and then if I go to the show, I'll buy an LP, whatever, like, and then you don't actually do it. Um, because, I mean, I've ripped CDs before, too, so it's not like I'm trying to be like, don't rip CDs, because, like, I'm probably going to go home and, you know, download a bunch of podcasts from This American Life and listen to those in my car, so. Um, but like I said earlier, I'm not going to feel bad because they use my music without paying me, so that's cool. Hey, speaking of CDs and LPs, don't you have some stuff here? Yeah, I did bring, I have some vinyl and some CDs for sale, including yeah. a new, I made this new tour CD called Silverface which I made a hundred copies of uh, for this Black Bond Super Rainbow Tour I just did, and I have like 50 of those left, so I have some of those too. Well, that's set up around here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure. It'll It'll probably probably be by the door. Yeah, by the door. You've got sort of a unique setup um, with the Anticon label. I mean, you've you've put out, what is it now? I mean, four or five, no, is maybe it, like six? It's, it's like five full lengths and then an EP. And, but yeah. some of them, some of them you've released on Anticon. Well, like five full length releases on Anticon, and then like, Three or three on my own. Yeah. Not so sure. you have the you you have the ability to kind of go do things. That you have a, that seems like a, a fairly um, healthy and open relationship with a label. Where it, it is good. Yeah. Whereas a lot of there's sort of the possessive thing, which is most most record contracts um, put you in kind of a bad place, and they want to own everything you do. It seems like you have a, a healthy one with Anticon. I was just curious. In you know 2011. What exactly the label has to offer a guy like you? I, you know, that's really that's a really good question. I mean, I think most of the time with labels that are around now, I mean, I can't speak for that many of them, but certain labels, sort of, you associate a sound with them, or like take a label like Home Tapes, right? So they have like Megaphone and All Tiny Creatures and Volcano Choir and all the sort of Eau Claire, North Carolina, that sort of sound. So. What else? Like, like Bear in Heaven, I think, is on that label too. But so, like, if they sign a new band and they was like, "We're gonna get behind this band and put this out," you kind of think, "Well, they did this other stuff; it must be cool." So I think that sort of label thing is more of like an association thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think still the most important thing for an artist, by far, is a good publicist. I mean, I think that you know, if you got enough money to pony up, you know, four grand for a really good publicist, and just release like. <coughs> A, you know, digital only, like release, like just selective, like online releasing of like three tunes with a really, really good publicist, then you can get signed. You know, it's like the money is all in like publicists who can get you like on the pitchfork forecast and all that mm -hmm. BS. Get you some real estate on the net or in, yeah. or in print. It's yeah, it, it's it really is. A they are not cheap. It's, no, it's, no, no, no. It's the money. It's it's the that's the money. It's more expensive than paying for the CDs. Getting a label to press your stuff. You could probably That's do it cheap. on your own. Getting a label to, you know, pay for recording, you're, they're going to pay more than if you were to do it, you know, sort of friend your way into yeah. studios. But publicist, a good publicist is, is a lot of money, an expensive endeavor. Um, you know, you've probably gotten the opportunity through playing with Andrew Bird to see a lot of places that have uh, been really fantastic. I was just curious if. Um, if there was any that stuck out in your head as the most the most impressive uh, venue that you've ever gotten to play, and another question that was posed by one of the audience members: pound for pound, what is your favorite venue when it comes down to it? Uh, when it comes down to it, I mean, I, I I can't take the cop out and say First Avenue, can I? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's that's but far and away, that's easy. That's that's not even there's no question. <laughs> What's the most impressive place that you've ever played, though? Mm. From the outside, the Sydney Opera House. What was it like on the inside? Total dump? Not very cool. It was, <laughs> the inside is a complete disappointment. Okay. 
Yeah, all the people that work there are like apologizing for the inside too. <laughs> it's, it's not very really cool. But no, but the Carnegie Hall was like the mo that was the most uh, jaw dropping sort of like I think I'm gonna you know I don't think I can do this kind of thing. Weak in the knees. Yeah. But yeah. Cause <laughs> How would you say that uh, after nine years, eight years, or so maybe maybe a little bit more? Ten. I don't know where you called it. Sort of point of origin. Um, after all the years doing what you do, that you are continuing, like, how is Dash stylistically evolving? I wrote this question before I watched you play that last song, which is an old song. Super old, yeah. And then seeing that sort of as a bookend to a chunk of new music, I, like, I, I, I guess it, I don't really have the question anymore. But, you know, because I heard it, I watched it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, are, I mean, maybe I'm just sort of, you know, regressing or like going back to the womb or whatever, but like, you know, I sort of played the first maybe four or five, or, yeah, five years pretty much strictly solo, and then started playing with Mike Lewis, and played with him from 2006 until middle of last year, until he started to get super busy, like he did stuff with gangs, and then Bon Iver, and bon Iver recording and stuff, so he's pretty and much... And also Bird. And Bird, yeah. And so, for about a year now, or maybe a little more than a year, I've been playing just by myself, so I'm sort of trying to rediscover how to play by myself, and keep it interesting and not boring, you know what I mean? Or like, so it's, that's a challenge. It's like, what I did eight years ago by myself doesn't necessarily translate now to, what, to now. Like, it's gotta be compelling and interesting. I'm not singing, I'm not dancing around, you know. You certainly have some new sounds. There are definitely some new sounds, yeah. There's a, there's a, uh, a few pages from the Rick Wakeman. Yeah, I got the Memotron, man. Pretty froggy, my bro. Little, my, little, my little digital Memotron. Yeah. Love that thing. I like it. Um, I think I had a couple more things, but I, am I missing anything that you guys wanted to, to know about? I mean, if there's anything that you that you really would... Oh, you, I see a hand out there. What's going on? What do you want to... How are the different ways that you're using your, your phrases again? Like, you were banging on it, like, and you were looping it, and I'm wondering if you're using it as a MIDI trigger. I just, I'm really curious about your setup. Yeah, the, the giant keyboard, that'd be awesome if I could use it as a MIDI trigger. Somebody probably has yeah, built... Yeah, some, I'm sure someone has built a, a modified a Rhodes to make it into some sort of MIDI trigger situation. But the MIDI thing, I'll have, I just use the Nord for the MIDI send to the little Mellotron unit underneath it. But uh, the Rhodes itself is just, I mean, this is just, the, if you go buy a Rhodes and you take the plastic top off of it, they're all like this. So I'm just running it through a uh, delay pedal and a tremolo pedal to sort of get the bendy kind of sound and then through a reverb pedal and a distortion pedal, and that's it. Any, anybody else out there have a question that they want? They, go ahead. Um, I have kind of a, I just, I usually just use three mics, so I have this old uh, AKG D12 in the kick drum, which is like, sits inside of it, it's like one of those old square mics from, like, from the 80s or whatever, and then usually for the snare and the floor time, it's just like one of those kind of clip-on Sennheiser deals, 604. Those sort of and they pick up enough of the cymbals to get them, because the cymbals are too bright, it's kind of, it can kind of overwhelm some other stuff, so they get in there enough to make it work. Anybody else? I see a hand back there. Yeah, uh, you, you talked about how you um, you don't when you get bored, you move on to something. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get bored with like your major beat? Like if you're in four and then you're like bored with it, do you do you just move on to you know the seventh, eighth note, and you're you know what I mean? Like just move on to something completely different. And occasionally, yeah. I mean, it's almost like because the 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 first layer of the loop is sort of immutable unless I erase it. I'm always kind of stuck with if, I, if the loop is is you know even you know four bars of four long, <clears throat> unless I want to erase that loop and start over again, I don't really have a choice. But sometimes, like you said, I'll do, maybe I'll just start playing three on top of it until it layers, you know, three more times and you have some crazy African thing going on. So, yeah, if it, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Red Hat. Yeah. What kind of uh, loop pedals pedals do you use? Uh, the two ones that I use mostly for the drums on the ground here is the Akai Headrush. Uh, one of them is an older one which holds about 12 seconds, another one holds about 18. And then up here is the, uh, the uh, what is it, Electro Harmonics 2880. And I use that for mostly like the string stuff, because I can kind of pan it and have like stereo stuff. Because the Akai Headrush are just in mono. That kind of spreads the sound out a little bit. Go ahead. Do you sometimes 
Great question. <laughs> I've actually asked that question on the air. No. I think maybe even twice. No, no. People would think I was a freak. <laughs> Not that that would matter. Um, you talk about like your general creative process, like writing process, and also like your creative process with other lawyers, like with another person. Yeah, I mean, the cre my creative process hasn't really changed very much. It's somebody asked me something out there a little while ago, and it's sort of. I'm always recording, I'm always working on stuff, so it, it's all these like timelines that some of them are extremely long, like some tunes from my last record, Tommy, I started those maybe in 2003 or 2004, whereas some of the tunes in the record before that, maybe I started three months before the record came out. So they're all, it, it's completely different, like, I just try to record everything and keep going back to stuff, listening to it, and something that I thought was terrible Five years ago when I made it, I might just stumble upon the file and open it up and be like, what's this? Wow, okay. And then get inspired and start layering on top of that. So it you know, the, it usually starts with something that's in time. Almost, you know, 85% of the time it's like either a drum loop, a rhythmic loop, or a sequence that's in time or something like that so I can, you know, have something to line it up to. But I never, I use Pro Tools too and I never, I never use Grid. Like I always just use, I always just line it up by eye. I was curious, in, in, in sort of an extension of that question, what percentage, or not maybe a percentage, but I mean, so much of, of, of what you do, I imagine, to be sort of textural improvisation. Um, you know, would you say that any of your finest melodic or rhythmic scores have come directly from just hopping on the jungle gym here and, you know, giving it a go? For sure. Yeah, I think probably most of my best melodies have come from that. Just sitting down and... Just sitting down with, like, because I mean, essentially, like, what you see up here, this is my studio, you know, in my basement. This is my basement. And then, like, except for I'll have maybe a bunch more nice microphones and a couple other instruments, different keyboards. But I have my computer set up, some good preamps, and then you know, fire up, fire up a tune from 2003, listen to it, like, oh, yeah, like, that's great. Okay, then I'll just, this, my roads might sound good on this and try goofing around a little bit. And hey, what do you know? I wrote a melody for the song. Cool. Good thing I